Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a very interesting little poem, Italian music in Dakota. This is poem number 35 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Uh, again, we're coming now to the end of this section. We have commented already that Autumn over related to the old, Rivulets over related to the new. And once again here, we're back to Whitman's love of music and opera, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, rejoin some earlier comments. Now, our assumption that, uh, that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, talks with all our playlists, and that you have been with us from those early poems, inscriptions to a certain country, comes to mind, up to and including um, uh, an in set of introductory comments to Autumn Rivulets that we've given. You'll remember Singer in the Prison is another one of these brilliant little poems that will celebrate great music, and we just fin finished uh, Wandering at Morn. Now, our, uh, our background information here from our Nortons, as we are often like to do, is going to give us some important insights here. First of all, this poem, new to Lisa Grass in 1881, is a memorial of Whitman's western trip of 1879. We've spoken about it in earlier lectures. Whitman never actually was in the Dakotas. The poet, however, may have heard the 17th Regimental Band while it was on tour in the region he traveled. Um, now, we've got three of his favorite operas that will be referenced here. Um, Sonambula's Innocent Love, for example, will be referencing Vincenzo Bellini's La uh, Sonambula, um, the, uh, uh, the Sleepwalker of 1831. The innocent heroine, Amina, is falsely accused of unfaithfulness when she walks asleep into the room of a strange man. Her affronted fiancé ultimately realizes the truth of the situation and the lovers are happily reunited. The line, Norma's Anguish, is going to be referencing uh, Bellina's Norma at the 1831 offering. The heroine, a high priestess of a Durid temple, breaks her vows by falling in love with Paulini, a Roman proconsul, and when he is unfaithful to her, she incites her people against them, but love makes her powerless to implement her revenge. Paulini, moved by her love, renounces his, uh, his own uh, perfidity, and then together they immobilate themselves in a funeral pyre. And finally, his reference to uh, Poluto is the opera by uh, Donizetti, um, uh, 1797 to 1848. Donizetti was famous for his choral power, his rare skill in writing for the voice, uh, as the Encyclopedia Britannica will say it. Now, as we turn to this poem, I find it fascinating that the word Italian for us has already uh, been used in Leaves of Grass. You'll remember it's so, um, Solemn Sweet Pipes of Oregon poem. And Dakota is mentioned for the first time in starting from Pominock number one. You'll notice in the, the parenthetics spread underneath the 17th, the finest regimental band I ever heard. That is to say, one more time, artists appreciating fine art, which takes us back to Ox Tamer and other poems of Autumn Rivulets. The poem now. Through the soft evening air in winding all, rocks, woods, fort, cannon, pacing centuries, endless wiles, Indulgent streams and flutes and cornets notes, electric, pensive, turbulent, artificial, yet strangely fitting even here, meanings unknown before, subtler than ever, more harmony, as if born here, related here, not to the city's fresco rooms, not to the audience of the opera house, sounds, echoes, wandering strains, as really here at home. Sonambula's innocent love, trios with Norma's anguish, and Thy ecstatic chorus, Poluto, rayed in the limpid, yellow, slanting sundown music, Italian music in Dakota. While nature, sovereign of this gnarled realm, lurking in hidden, barbaric, grim recess, acknowledging rapport, however far removed, as some old root or soil of earth, its last-born flower or fruit listens, well pleased. Now I find, especially at the end of this poem, some of the most rhythmic poetry of Leaves of Grass, and I'll try and point it out as we go. Notice, first of all, we begin with setting. Through the soft evening air, in whining, this in whining, you'll remember from Lilac's last uh, passage 14. Again, I told you, there's always this thing about the hugging or the grasping or the embracing, right? Now, the, the soft evening air, in whining all, and now we start with nature, rocks, woods, then we go to technology, fort, cannon, pacing centuries. We heard this already uh, when we were, when we were uh, talking about prison, right? Um, endless wiles. In other words, you have 
this recognition that you have this fort in this out this kind of outpost in the west in Dakota and then you have out beyond it the wilds of nature and in the center of all of this you have this regimental band playing this operatic music which is going to be a strange anomaly in other words we have two things trying to fit together and obviously we're going to play the game of autumn rivulets and why it's in this collection in dolce screen, um, streams you'll remember this from to a, a certain contrariety as well in flutes and cornets notes electric pensive turbulent and then finally artificial in other words it is art. It is constructed to be artificial, okay? And then in parenthetics, yet, strangely fitting even here, that is to say Dakota, the middle of nowhere, meanings unknown before. In other words, it's almost as if this music is more powerful when it is played out in the middle of nowhere, Dakota. Subtler than ever. More harmony. As if born here, related here, not to the cities frescoed rooms, not to the audience of the opera house. Sounds, echoes, wandering strains, as really here at home. Now, I find this fascinating. Whitman had a very strange dance, as scholars have pointed out, about his relationship to opera. At first, maybe not liking it, then deciding that he liked it, then deciding that he loved it because of the artistic nature of opera. But there was always this interesting tension because, of course, he wants American music. He wants American everything. And, of course, he's going to have to ask, how is it that we can bring this old European music over to America and appreciate it? Notice his argument. It actually sounds better out here. Why? Because we're in nature. And when we're in nature, we can appreciate the melodic sounds far better. Then, of course, he references in this, in this parenthetic, he references the three operas that he loves. Sonambula's Innocent Love, Trios with Norma's Anguish, Diastatic Chorus of Polito, and, again, three of his favorite uh, pieces of, of, of uh, opera. And then he says it, Raid in the limpid yellow slanting sundown. In other words, far better than the light of the theater is the light of the sun going down out in nature. And then he'll finish music, Italian music, in Dakota. Now, <clears throat> I love that he's trying to put two things that don't go together, together, and he's arguing it makes all the sense in the world. It really does. It makes all the sense in the world. And to this degree, obviously, autumn rivulets is played together, the two sides of the paradox. Now, the way the poem ends is, for me, compelling in terms of especially the rhythms. Just notice the use of the word nature capitalized to take us again back to this if born here idea, that is to say the West. While nature, sovereign of this gnarled realm, and all of a sudden, you'll remember gnarled from Song of Myself 37, all of a sudden, it's almost as if Whitman himself decides to begin to speak in poetic, operatic types of overexposed language. That is to say, he's going to play the game of opera and Lillibrand. While nature sovereign of this gnarled realm, lurking in hidden barbaric grim recesses, and I, like I said to you guys, I think he's having a lot of fun with these poems. That he uses the word barbaric takes us obviously back to the barbaric yap of 52, Song of Myself, right? In other words, there's something amazing about the very powerful gnarled realm of nature and in this music, lurking in the hidden barbaric grim recesses, acknowledging rapport. Notice it was harmony earlier, now it's rapport. However far removed. In other words, true art is going to be best appreciated in nature. Right? And then, uh, and then a, a, a last parenthetic, as some, it's an interesting simile, in a book of poems called Leaves of Grass. As some old root, obviously there's our autumn, or soil of earth, its last born flower or fruit, there's your rivulet. In other words, even out of the old, new is produced. And here, he says, it just makes all the sense in the world with that parenthetic, listens, nature, listens, well pleased. I, uh, Whitman's readers would, of course, make this well pleased as in good, and we commented on this in earlier poems. Uh, back to Genesis 1, God saw that it was good. This idea that nature is looking on and applauding the fact that the artificial, that is to say the opera, being performed in Dakota is somehow going to make the opera 
that much better, that much more real. Which takes us to 2a. Well, I think his argument is that, in fact, nature somehow is transcendent to the artificial, but the two of them can produce harmony, music. And I think, obviously, that was the word picture that Whitman was constantly wanting to see happen as he was talking about the post-Civil War America. And to be, I love the references to the three operas. And notice he just assumes knowledge of those three operas. That is to say, he assumes a sophisticated reader. And yet he's talking about Dakota, where you have sentries out walking around the fort to protect the fort from, what, some outside type of uh, attack or something like that. And then at 3A, well, we can think, obviously, of all the great Italian operas that come to mind. And we mentioned to a certain contraceptive as well. And the way in which uh, Whitman was very influenced by poetry and by music, and he saw them as synonymous, which finally at 3B asks about your views regarding opera and your favorite music, and is your musical tastes changing? And is it true that it's funner to read Whitman's Leaves of Grass when you're out somewhere in nature, at the park, maybe taking a walk, or out in the badlands where we live, or up in the mountains, or next to a mountain stream or something? I think Whitman would argue, my poetry sounds better when you're reading it at the park to your child, or your grandchild. Thank you.